one of the PGY fours here. Our grand round speaker today is Dr. Melissa Kramer, who has been working with trauma her whole career. She did a trauma specific concentration during her doctoral work in Chicago and has worked at the Boise VA for over 11 years. The bulk of that time has been in the PTSD clinical team. Her other focus is telemental health, and she is now the Boise TMH program manager. She has been a psychotherapy supervisor for the last five years and helped develop CPT specific rotations for increased opportunities for psychiatry residents to learn and practice trauma work. Thank you, Jared. I am gonna talk about um, complex trauma today. I just wanna start off by saying um, I'm working off of one monitor today. So um, I am not gonna be able to monitor the chat as I'm doing the presentation. So Jared, um, if you could potentially help out with that as we're going through today, um, if people have questions, put it in the chat. Uh, I have no issue with people jumping in and asking questions as we're going as well. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and see if I can uh, get us into So even though I closed Teams, I think my um, notifications may still pop up from there. Can you guys see my screen um, as a whole, as well as me right now? Yes. Yes, okay, good. So again, what we're gonna be talking about is complex trauma and PTSD. When I was talking with Jared about Grand Rounds and some of the topics that would be beneficial for Grand Rounds, we were talking about how oftentimes people get kind of a overall five minute version of PTSD and it's helpful to just go over things again, kind of reiterate some of that stuff as well as talk about some more complex issues. And I also wanna take some time to really focus on how, how treatment looks at the VA, how to refer for treatment at the VA um, and making sure that I shared that information with you guys as well and leave enough time for questions. So I'm going to try to keep going as quickly as possible while still giving you as much information as I can. Um, as always, because it's a VA presentation, I always start with the opinions and information presented herein are my own and not that of the Boise VA. And I'm receiving no financial compensation for this or um, any of my presentations. So um, there's the standard VA disclaimer. And of course it doesn't want to, there we go. So let me see if I can move myself here. Okay, so as we're going through this today, we're gonna to be looking at defining and reviewing trauma, and PTSD, uh, looking at the, con the complex trauma definition and complex PTSD, looking at the unique clinical presentation, using a case example and um, talking about specific recommendations for complex PTSD. I wanna get um, the input of you guys on what type of things this mirrors. If this looks similar to other types of presentations you're used to and discuss treatment options, not just for complex PTSD, but PTSD in general and what that looks like here at the Boise BAMC. So for you guys, what comes to mind when you hear the word trauma? What pops up? Go ahead and unmute if you can. Uh, if you want to share, if not, throw it in the chat and then I'm going to put it on Jared to let me know what's there. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Oftentimes, work at VA, just in general. And trauma doesn't just have to be psychological trauma, right? There's a lot of different ways we can look at the, at the term trauma. That which cannot be expressed in words. Trauma can. So if we look at the overall general idea of trauma, right, a destructive agent or incident, Physical medicine, physical or bodily injury that's sudden in onset and severe in nature, and psychological trauma, this exposure to actual or threatened death, 
injury, sexual violence, and one or more of the following in one or more of the following ways, directly experiencing it, witnessing it, learning about it, repeated exposure to details, emotional, and all of this trauma causes emotional, cognitive, and behavioral distress. So what is trauma? We hear a lot from our vets at the VA, but we don't just have our folks from the VA on Grand Rounds today. We have folks from the community as well. So when we look at psychological trauma, what are you guys looking for in terms of that? We're looking for a criterion A events, so an event or events in which the person's exposed to actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence or continued exposure to trauma throughout their, their work with trauma, whether that be first responders or things of that nature. Often, when we work in the VA, we kind of get tunnel visioned into thinking that everybody has trauma because so many folks in the VA do present with trauma. Um, overall, looking at it in terms of community wide, societally wide, experiencing trauma is not as uncommon as one would think. So, probably about 60% of men and 50% of women. Often people think those numbers would be uh, flip flopped, but um, if we look at the different types of trauma, um, we see that a lot of people have experienced trauma at some point in their life. One of the things that we talk a lot about in the PCT when we're doing education with folks, <coughs> whether that be education screening or at the beginning of treatment, is the difference between PTS, post-traumatic stress, and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And we'll talk about that again as we move throughout this presentation. But one of the things that I find very important and normalizing for people is that sense of really focusing on PTS is not something that's uncommon for people. So much, so much of the time people come in with a really negative response of like, oh, I can't have trauma symptoms or I can't have like, you know, I, I'm, I'm a guy, I shouldn't feel this way or, or a lot of the societal rules that come around that and normalizing PTS can be a really important thing when it comes to getting to the point where you can talk to a person about their trauma and have recommendations for trauma therapy. So when we look at categories of trauma in terms of, um, you know, how we conceptualize things versus a, more of a single incident trauma or complex trauma, we look at a type one trauma would be a single or intermittent incident that's often sudden or time limited in duration. So the person who's had a single motor vehicle accident or um, one IED or one firefight that they were involved in. Type two would be continuous, repetitive, and chronic incident in nature or duration, and typically comprises a person's personality development or basic trust, or sorry, compromises per personality development or basic trust in primary relationships. So this is where we see childhood sexual abuse, childhood physical abuse, um, a lot of more of the complex trauma things that are the, that chronic trauma in nature that happens over time and impacts how they can form relationships. So to take us a step backwards and kind of go back to overall, what is PTSD? So it is a severe psychiatric disorder associated with trauma. We have the symptom clusters, the buckets we could call them. First one's re-experiencing that you're going to get when people are having either intrusive thoughts when they don't want to have them during the day. And I, and I make sure to, to reiterate with people that is a daytime thing. So either they have the intrusive thoughts that are popping in when they don't want to have them. When we explain that to folks, I say that's when your head goes back to the trauma, whether that be an accident or Afghanistan or what have you. But you know your feet are still in Boise. Flashbacks are also daytime experiences or, or waking experiences per se, where your head and your feet are back at the trauma, whether that be a motor vehicle accident or, or Afghanistan, and you're not aware that you're in Boise. And then nightmares are part of the re-experiencing bucket. Avoidance and numbing, the second bucket, is usually the strongest bucket for everybody because the more you practice avoidance, the better at it you get. 
And some of our folks have been practicing avoidance for quite an extended period of time. So this can be avoiding people, places, or things that remind them of the trauma, as well as it's avoiding emotions or mood, like emotions or memories of the trauma, talking about the trauma, all of those types of things fall under the avoidance and or emotional numbing bucket. Those are our people that say, doc, I don't feel anything. I'm just angry or I'm numb. And so really working with them about understanding emotional fluency and what that looks like and, and how they've been really numbing out to not feel anything. Alterations in cognitions and mood. This is the bucket that often looks like depression symptoms. So when people have the depressed affect, the negative affect, when they have the anhedonia, they've lost interest in doing things that they used to like to do separate from the trauma experience. Um, so it's not avoidance-based, it's more of a, meh, I just don't have the energy to do what I used to like to do. And this is also where we see the alterations in cognitions, what we call stuck points in CPT. So the thoughts about blame, uh, responsibility, the thoughts about worth being impacted, um, a lot of those negative uh, cognitive patterns that you see. And then the hyperarousal or hypervigilance, that is the jumpiness, the startle response, the trouble falling asleep, the quick to anger, the risk-taking type behaviors that you're gonna see in that symptom bucket. See a few things popping up in the chat. I'm gonna see if I can pull that up and see. Um, I see a question from Dr. April Rose. Does everyone who's experienced trauma have PTSD? No, <laughs> they do not. Uh, and in fact, that's on here. Just because a person has experienced trauma in his or her life, it doesn't automatically mean they have PTSD. And even beyond that, even if somebody has PTSD, that may not be their presenting problem at this point in time. Um, it may be something that they get to eventually, but their, their current pressing presenting problem may be relational in nature or things like that. And um, just because there's trauma in there, it shouldn't just be a straight um, assumption that, that they would want to be and or ready to be doing trauma work. And we'll continue to talk about that as we move through. So just want to go over the DSM criteria with you guys. So criterion A, what we talked about, exposure to actual or threatened death, injury, sexual violence, directly experiencing it, witnessing, learning about it. We have people who have experienced kind of a sub-level criterion A that sometimes get referred to the PCT. And it's hard in terms of looking at trauma work because we don't have an identifiable criterion A index trauma to be working on. So that is something when you see our PCT consults that is an important question for us do they have an index trauma that we can be working on in trauma work? So again, you can see the symptom buckets here. Criterion B is that first symptom bucket. So are they having one or more of the intrusive symptoms? Are they having persistence of avoidance in criterion C? Are they having two or more negative alterations in cognition or mood? Are marked alterations in arousal or reactivity by two or more criterion E? Disturbance is greater than a month. And then where we see people move from PTS to PTSD is that criterion G, disturbance in, or it's causing distress or impairment in terms of social, occupational, or other areas of functioning. And this is, again, a, a place where we do a lot of psychoeducation with our vets. Like, if this is getting to the point where your avoidance or you're trying to shut down life and make it so that you're not blowing up or there's not all of those points of whack-a-mole, you, you're not getting triggered by something you hear or you smell, you're not getting triggered by driving, you're not avoiding because you're having flashbacks or any, you're not sleeping because of nightmares. If all of that is getting to the point where it's impacting your social and occupational functioning, it's not letting you live the life that you want to be living, that's when we hit that criterion G. And as with many of our other um, disorders, it's not attributable to substance abuse or medical condition. So these are some of our, these numbers are a little bit older um, in terms of the stats here from the National Center for PTSD. They, they're, um, some of our veteran stats are updated just to about the 2017 level. 
Um, so if you look at the overall general population, usually about seven to eight percent of the overall general population has PTSD at some point in their life, higher in women than men, uh, which is often what people would expect. And not surprisingly, greater among military veterans. So the Vietnam era, um, some of these, you'll see some of these um, quotes in terms of the statistics kind of varying. It has a lot to do with how much they're willing to share. Um, so overall, probably about 30% of men and about 26 to 27% of women in the Vietnam era report PTSD. Um, Gulf War is a little bit lower and OEF, OIF, OND, we see a tick up to closer to 14%. So if we look at um, just a little bit about the, the veteran population, um, our veteran population is slated to be decreasing every year um, through probably about 2040, 2043. We're going to have a continued downward trend because we do have a, an aging veteran population. A lot, we have a lot more, um, a much greater percentage of our society served in past conflicts than in current ones or most recent ones. If we look at the population of veterans in the state of Idaho, the most recent data, again, is about 2017, 2018 data. And that was that about 40% of our veteran population is Vietnam era population. And that is higher than the national average. Um, overall, our veteran population in the state of Idaho is a little bit higher than the national average. This could be for a lot of reasons. Um, this could be political in nature. This could be more geographic in nature. Um, this could also be um, cultural in nature in the sense of supporting of, um, individual rights and or um, more of a hunting, uh, outdoor hunting culture. Um, so there's a lot of things that could go into why veterans move to this area more than other places in the U.S. But our, our population, our Vietnam veteran population is higher than the national average at about 40% of our population. And we are higher than the national average in terms of age range for two sets of the age range of population, which is often what we see a lot of here at the VA. So we're higher than the national average for 35-year-olds to 54-year-olds, as well as the 65 to 74-year-old bracket. Um, so again, we have a much higher um, percentage of people coming in to our VA, and uh, we've all seen that in terms of uh, what we've had in terms of our increase in clinic and wait lists and, and all those things. So that's a little bit of a background on PTSD in general. So before I jump any further into talking about complex trauma, are there any questions that people have about PTSD and any of, any of what we've talked about so far? Again, you can throw them in the chat or um, just unmute yourself and jump in and ask any questions you might have. So seeing none, let's jump into more of what is complex trauma. So if we look at the overall conceptualization of what is complex com complex trauma, it's exposure to multiple traumatic stressors. So it's continuous or pervasive in its dur duration, and it's more chronic and severe in its nature. Um, so I see Deborah just threw a question in. So how long after crisis trauma would you screen for PTS? Um, so you want to make sure that it's there. It, it's been going on for at least um, a, a month in terms of its impact on functioning. When you're looking at something within a month to six months of trauma, you're probably looking at more of an adjustment disorder type thing versus going longer out past the trauma. You're going to have more of the PTSD. That doesn't mean that you can't be seeing people and touching base with them within one to three months post trauma. Um, but again, normalizing that the PTS is going to be there. I don't have a lot of experience with like dis like the immediate disaster response. Um, I know they've changed perspectives on what they do for disaster response and um, 
kind of the Red Cross approach to things and, and the way that they do um, more immediate work post-trauma, especially if it's a natural disaster or mass cash or things like that. Um, but I would say that you you would want to wait a little bit for screening until you're starting to see um, things impact. Um, and again, doing more education about PTS um, because they may they're likely not coming to you until it's getting to the D level, at least for us in, in the PCT. Does that answer your question, Deborah? So again, kind of going back to complex trauma, it's that chronic severe nature pervasive. It most often has that interpersonal context to it. It again, most often occurs at developmentally vulnerable times. So often in childhood or early adolescence, and it has the potential to severely compromise normal development, especially when looking at relational attachment and things of that nature. In a lot of these situations, there's also not a component of escape possible due to physical, psychological, maturational, social, or family constraints. When there are children, they're stuck in the household, even if their household is an abusive household, because as a six-year-old, you don't have the capacity to go out and be doing things on your own. So looking at how that's a component of this as well. So what are some examples of complex trauma? Before I throw a few up, you guys want to throw some out? What would be complex trauma from your perspective? Like physical, like physical abuse from parents or the same side, like sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. Repeated abuse scenarios, yep. Whether that be physical or sexual in nature or both. So, yep, childhood abuse, neglect, recruitment into armed conflict as a child adolescent. So our, our child soldiers, um, again, things that we may not see here in the U.S. or, or in the VA setting, but those of you working with some of our refugees um, at FMRI and, and other places may see some of that. Victims of domestic violence and or sex trafficking, ongoing religious or narcissistic abuse. Yep, I think that's a, a big one. I don't have uh, religious abuse on here, but that's that's definitely a perspective. That's a really good one to look at. Exposure to genocide campaigns or other forms of organized violence, exposure to wars and non-combatant. Again, if we're looking at our refugee populations being held hostage or POWs or political detainment are just a few examples. What do you guys think of bullying? Would that be something that we'd look at, especially in the changes of bullying when it comes to social media, online aspects of things? What are your thoughts about that? Is that anything you're seeing clinically for any of you, whether VA or otherwise? Those of you at BSU, perhaps. So something to think about when you're talking with a veteran, again, I'm gonna fall back into veteran because that's my primary kind of way of looking at this at the VA. But when you're talking with a patient or a client, um, looking at if that's something that they've experienced and that's, oh, and Jordan saying we had the discussion yesterday between the difference of criterion A trauma. Yep, so really looking at this, I'd be interested to hear more about that discussion from uh, the BSU, um, whether that was your T group or if that was just at BSU in, in the clinic, um, because there are times where people are convinced that what they've experienced is the worst thing in the world. This is something that we, um, this is something that sometimes veterans struggle with. Um, their criteria in A trauma may be, or their world experiences may be very different than other people, especially in a college setting who are 17, 18, 19 years old, um, and perhaps have not had the same types of life experiences and kind of downgrading whether that counts or not. Um, it sounds like that was um, perhaps some of the gist of the discussion that you guys had yesterday. So looking at what is complex PTSD, 
again, going beyond just complex trauma, but the sequelae from a culmination of multiple or prolonged traumatic experiences. And this is symptoms beyond what's captured by a PTSD diagnosis. For a lot of people, as we talk through these things, I hear, huh, this sounds a lot like borderline personality disorder or how we conceptualize that and really looking at how there can be a lot of Venn diagram overlap there. And if perhaps complex PTSD fits more, um, again, not in the DSM at this point in time, but if we're gonna look at conceptualizing it, it's, it would be kind of spectrum based, which is how a lot of us conceptualize personality disorders kind of being along a spectrum and having characteristics of this versus um, just an all or nothing and it's developmentally based. And again, there's no formal diagnosis. Um, and Ryan is saying if chronic enough, high enough threat, inner city life gang recruitment, mm -hmm. there's a lot of different things where you see childhood abuse within the chronic stress environment. So yeah, lots of different, different ways this could come up. Um, we are not as urban. Uh, you know, I, I came from Chicago for my graduate program um, and urban areas and gang violence and, and kind of that overall sense of you have no option for getting out um, is there a lot. I worked with a patient there who I conceptualized as experiencing complex PTSD and, and I had a supervisor say, well, there's no way that this person has experienced trauma the majority of their life. And we talked about this case and this was an individual when I worked with her, she was 26 years old and had five children. She was about to have her sixth child at 26, one of whom was conceived consensually. And looking at the impact that that had had on her and her parenting and her attachments to adults in her life, as well as her attachments to her children and, um, and what that looked like. And it was, it was definitely for her parenting, parenting was traumatic in itself um, because for her, it was a consistent reminder of her experiences and um, that she didn't have support and that she wasn't safe. Um, so when we look at criteria, so not only are they meeting the core PTSD symptoms in terms of diagnosis of PTSD as we know it, but also disturbance and self-regulation in some or all of five main domains that we look at for kind of conceptualization around complex PTSD. So emotional and affect regulation, interpersonal disturbances, alterations in attention or consciousness, adversely affected belief systems, and then somatic distress or disorganization. So again, for a lot of people, they're like, wait, I'm hearing a lot of personality disorder characteristics in that. And, and that kind of jumps out for a lot of people. And I would, I would say, yes, that is definitely something that we see. And, and so the, the discussion here is, how do we realize the overlap between this rather than just saying these, these things are different? So if we're gonna look specifically at the emotion regulation and, and affect regulation, so persistent dysphoria, self-injury, chronic suicidal preoccupation, really the explosive rage anger or like really inhibited, really suppressed and, or repressed, Compulsive or inhibited sexuality and substance and poly substance abuse is something that we see here um, quite often. For the interpersonal bucket, you're gonna have isolation and withdrawal, disruption in relationships, inability to trust or the trusting too quickly, that push-pull type thing, re-victimization, repeated search for rescue or victimization of others. And remember, like in a lot of these things, there will likely be a lot of uh, emergence of this in transference and countertransference when you're working with a patient like this. So just to be aware of that. Alterations in attention and consciousness. So amnesia or hypermnesia, transient dissociative episodes. We have a lot of people that kind of beyond that, like, oh yeah, I was driving and I just got to like an exit four past mine. But that sense of, I don't remember huge parts of my childhood or I felt like I was floating for a good portion of my childhood. 
depersonalization or derealization, um, intrusive PTSD symptoms, or ruminative preoccupation with symptoms or trauma. So people that kind of really hyper-focus on that. Adversely affected belief systems kind of go around self, others, and perpetrators. Um, so self, what we would think of in terms of a lot of the guilt, shame, helplessness, defilement, alienation. Others is nobody can understand, everybody's dangerous or can't be trusted. Judgment, abandonment, again, we see some of that push-pull stuff. Perpetrators or others, preoccupation with power, attribution of total power, I kind of think of um, the, uh, like in hostage situations, um, when people get to that, um, that sense of like associating with or, or siding with their perpetrators. Idealization or acceptance or integration of the perpetrator's belief system. And I think this is one of those things um, when I have worked with people with chronic abuse and complex trauma that come from religious systems, um, that piece of whether they, their spirituality is still there, um, whether they still feel like that religious faith is appropriate for them, if they kind of separate that from the trauma or not, um, because of our area, the most frequent religious group that I work with in terms of um, childhood abuse and, and um, kind of how it interplays with religion has been an LDS population. Um, and really looking at, are they separating their faith from their trauma experiences or are they kind of lumping all of that together? Um, are they feeling like they still have to have those belief systems in order to have close contact with family members and things of that nature and, and how that impacts their ability to do trauma work? Somatic distress or disorganization, a lot of chronic anxiety or preoccupation with physical distress, chronic pain, cardiopulmonary symptoms, conversion symptoms, or sexual symptoms. Um, this can also be a cultural piece, right? If they come from a cultural background that is more okay with a somatic presentation of illness rather than an emotional one, that could be playing a part of that as well. So as you're assessing people, you're always wanting to look at their cultural background and how that piece um, of, that, um, of their identity and their diversity kind of plays a role into how, they're, how they've learned about expressing trauma and how that is okay for them. So we can talk about a case example here. Um, I do wanna note that we're getting close to time. So what I may do is kind of jump ahead, come back to the case if we can, but I wanna make sure that we talk about how we do treatment for complex PTSD, like what that looks like as well as treatment options within the Boise VA. So when you're looking at complex PTSD, it's really gonna be a phase-based approach to treatment. So safety and stabilization first. Um, this should sound familiar to a lot of you who have experience in DBT and, and training around that. So safety, stabilization, um, then the processing can also, not only an emotional processing, but grief processing. So remembrance and mourning. So putting words and emotion to their trauma, creating meaning, this is where we're gonna have our um, evidence base, our EVPs for PTSD. And then reconnection and integration. Um, so kind of looking forward into how they can um, create and, and maintain meaningful relationships and supports, especially if they don't have experience with healthy and, and meaningful relationships in the past. Um, because a lot of you are psychiatry here, not everybody, but I really want to focus on that. This is a lot where we see people coming in, kind of that need of safety and stabilization, and they don't have that, like that constant crisis thing, or they are flight for help coming in for crisis at that point in time. So looking at how do we do the safety and stabilization first before we can get them into some more of the, the processing work of things. Just like treating medical trauma, it's important to assess for and provide stability. So similar to ways that you would interact with hopefully every single one of your patients, veteran or otherwise, respect and understanding, conveying a sense of openness and neutrality, 
um, especially if there are cultural differences, political differences, any and all of those things, and paying attention to your patient's condition and what they're saying. And remember, please don't assume that just because they have a trauma history, they have uh, PTSD, um, or that, again, that's a piece for them that is important in their, like, into their presentation of what they're looking for. So use the PTSD clinical team, use the assessment team, um, use all of those resources for specialized assessment and treatment. And please, please, please remember, PTSD should never be diagnosed solely based on a symptom screener, PCL5 being one, but also a four question screener um, that, that they see more in um, primary care. But please just don't diagnose based on that and that alone. Um, so in terms of safety and stability, we have a lot of DBT options, um, individual and group treatment. Um, there's trauma symptom management, which is a much more educational based um, psychoed approach, STAIR, skills training and affective and interpersonal regulation. Um, STAIR is something that we offer at both group and individual um, through the PCT. And it, when I describe it to people, it's often if DBT and CPT, cognitive processing therapy, had a baby. Um, STAIR is really focused on um, affect regulation and um, interpersonal regulation around relationships and, and things of that nature. Um, Yep, EMDR, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, Deborah, uh, it is technically not a VA recognized um, EBP, but it is something <coughs> that there is a lot of evidence for and we do offer in the PCT. Um, so when we get to the processing level, we have the PTSD clinical team, so outpatient treatment, and then we have the residential um, treatment the TRC that just reopened. Um, and so I wanna make sure that we um, do a plug for that as well, because uh, they're both outstanding treatment opportunities. So on the outpatient side of the house, we have individual and group options um, with face-to-face -face and telemental health options available um, for both individual and group. Um, so when we're looking at individual, we're following the clinical practice guidelines for PTSD treatment. And so we offer, um, what is considered the, the VA gold standards, cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure. And we offer EMDR. We have several, um, several of our folks trained in that. And when we look at what people are wanting to do, we try to do the shared decision-making with the veteran and talking through options, understanding their learning style, understanding their trauma and how it has most impacted them in terms of which EVP they're looking at. In terms of groups, we have, uh, again, the trauma symptom management. We have STAIR. We have written exposure therapy, which is another um, empirically supported treatment that um, does writing about, uh, writing about trauma and then they're doing their own processing. It is not, um, it's not a, a group in which they're sharing their trauma and doing the processing in the group. Um, and then we have, um, for those of you who don't know, our newer chaplain, um, chaplain Ian Homework. He is a phenomenal uh, behavioral health chaplain and is doing moral injury work um, in behavioral health as well and great resource if you haven't used, uh, used him. Um, and we are looking at, start, I also do a CPT group and we're looking at starting an in vivo group where we would be practicing going out into the community, going to Walmart, going and sitting in a coffee shop with your back to the door, doing those things in the context of being supported uh, with other veterans and with a clinician. So that's kind of an overview of the groups that we have on the outpatient side of the house. Residential is, um, again, an eight week program. They have the SUD side and the PTSD side. Um, they do individual and group in uh, all of their programming. And um, often when we have much more complex cases or um, complex co-occurring cases um, that rises to the level of acuity that they would struggle to do that work on an outpatient setting and be able to, to have social and occupational functioning, those are the types of cases that we look at for the residential setting. Um, so, Consults, 
There are consults for both outpatient PCT and the TRC, or you can reach out to myself, uh, Dr. Dr. April Rose, who's on the, the chat today, or Naomi Johnson. Uh, Rodney Dotson is also on our team and Dr. Mark Heine. Um, any one of us could be answering questions for folks. Um, and yes, April, though the VA has not recognized endorsed EMDR yet, the National Center for PTSD recognizes it um, at the level of CPT and PE. Um, the hope is that there's um, out of um, Cleveland with uh, Dr. Kate Chard, there's going to be some research going on um, starting pretty soon here comparing um, PE and EMDR so that we could hopefully rise it, uh, get it to that level of um, the gold standard EVP within the VA. So all of those are offerings that we have in the clinic though, and we have trained clinicians for all of those. Questions, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So what questions do y'all have about PTSD diagnosis, about complex trauma or complex PTSD or any of the treatments that we offer? Uh, yeah, thank, thank you so much. I just had a quick question about like any referrals about differentiating personality structure issues from complex PTSD. Okay, I, my sound went in and out. Can you say that again? Yeah, the question's from uh, one of our residents, Jordan. He was wondering if you had any um, kind of like tips of how to differentiate complex trauma from like personality structure issues. So, I don't think that they necessarily have to be mutually exclusive, um, but there is so much stigma around people getting personality disorder, like looking at, oh, you're, and then, then there are labels, oh, you're borderline or things of that nature. Um, and that idea of intractability when it comes to treating personality disorders. And if you're willing to look at this as, um, more of a complex personality or complex trauma and complex PTSD, the ability for kind of shifting more there. Um, they may still meet criteria for both. Um, and, you know, we're not billing for complex PTSD. Um, so I would say that it's not necessarily a one or the other, but likely um, both and really allowing the idea of recovery model to be an underpinning rather than just the idea of, oh, you have a personality disorder and it's going to be there forever and there's no change around that and, and trying to shift in that nature. How many providers do we have? Um, April can help me um, with this if I get it wrong. Right now we have three um, or four, one of whom is um, Dr. Julia Owenshaw, who's in the TRC, um, but we have multiple providers on outpatient PCT and a few of the few other providers are going to get trained in the next year. Um, there is a pretty big push for EMDR right now. A lot of people are coming in asking for that. Um, Prince Harry apparently talked about it and how he had EMDR and it changed him. And there have been several other things similar to when people come in and there's been a 60 minute special on the stellate ganglion block and everybody is coming in wanting that. Or there was a fad for a while in Idaho about the hyperbaric oxygen chamber treatment and looking at that without any evidence support behind that. Um, so sometimes we'll see different things come in um, in terms of people asking specifically. Following the the shared decision-making model, we're going to take all that into account. And also, we want to really facilitate openness. April, it looks like you just typed the exact thing I was going to say. Um, really, we're looking at how do we explain all treatment options um, and really facilitate openness about all different types of treatment and, and what they can do for them. We refer people to the National Center for PTSD website a ton, and it would be awesome if other people could do that as well. There's a lot of really great education videos on there, not only about what PTSD is, there's a good whiteboard video for that, but also about the treatments and, and what that entails. And if you guys have more questions, um, jump, up, jump onto that and look at that. There's a section for providers as well. 
Um, Deborah, acupuncture could be helpful in the context of, um, yep, just, to, just as April. Thank you, April, for helping me man the chat um, and uh, adding answers into here. Um, that biofeedback piece um, and looking at body awareness and understanding all of that and, and incorporating coping skills, whether that be acupuncture, whether that be mindfulness and recommending the mindfulness coach, recommending the PTSD coach. Um, if you guys aren't recommending apps to folks when they come in and see you, and this can go for outside of the VA too, our VA apps, um, such as PTSD coach, PE coach, PTSD, uh, the family coach, um, CPT coach, ACT coach, there's a STAIR coach and mindfulness coach. All of those apps are great apps. Some of them are specific treatment companion apps, and some of them are just self-help tools that really teach people about what mindfulness is um, and, and how, it, how they can start to incorporate those things in their everyday life. MST and Beyond app is a great one. Um, there's another app about, um, uh, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but something about change and wanting to change the, their, their relationship with alcohol or substances. For those of you um, at the VA, I have a whole bunch of prescription pads for the apps in my office and you can prescribe the apps to people. And it includes the little picture of what the app looks like in both the Apple store and in the Android store um, so that they can find those quickly. Those are all free of charge. And again, they are not veteran specific. They also do not have information sharing in terms of PHI, which is something often our people are worried about. Um, there's no PHI uh, sharing. The only time there's um, information sharing is if there's app crashes. Um, there are, for, for the treatment companion apps, those apps do have um, some of the worksheets and stuff in there, but it does not, unfortunately, communicate with My Healthy Vet or mental health assistant in a way that would be helpful for us to get that information into the chart. Um, so for those of you that are wanting to do understand a little bit more about measurement-based care or more assessments in terms of what you're looking at, having BH touch is a good thing. And that would be a whole other grand rounds I could talk to you about with measurement-based care. Um, so we can talk about that. Um, Dr. Billington, two handouts you'd highly recommend. Yeah, jump on. Let us know what, you, what you've got. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Dr. Kramer, thank you so much. I love hearing the presentation. It's been a while since I've seen you. Hello again. Uh, Hello. You are actually the one that started the CPT rotation for the psychiatry residents. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember those days fondly. I would highly encourage the residents to do uh, specific training in trauma. Uh, I always invaluable to my residency education. But hello, everyone. I'm Ryan or Dr. Billington. I'm one of the consult liaison psychiatrists out at, uh, in St. Luke's. But I, there's uh, two handouts that I thought were incredibly helpful around this complex issue. I'll often print them out and give them to patients. And in an outpatient setting, that saved me a lot of time and helped with the collaborative discussion. They're from uh, an institute that's not like formally recognized. You're more than welcome to research it. But if you Google mind uh, and then PTSD handout, there'll be a PDF for that. And mind, M-I-N-D, uh, borderline personality disorder handout. Those are two of... Um, two handouts that I found to be incredibly useful to empower people to explore some of those experiences and those diagnoses when they can be highly stigmatizing and see some of that overlap. So those were really helpful for me. All right. Thanks, Ryan. And good to see that you are out and about in the community. Any other questions that people have, whether it be in person, um, jump on, unmute yourself ask whether it be on the chat. Charlie, I see you back there in the back of the room. It's good to see you. Hi, Dr. Kramer. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk really briefly about the TRC and just like what that entails, like how long patients are there and stuff like that. Yeah, so it depends on which side of the house you go into for the TRC. 
Um, so you're looking at more four weeks on the sud side of the house, eight weeks on the t on the PTSD side of the house. There is some cross in terms of um, if we have folks come in who have um, a lot of substance, the, the co-occurring piece, a lot of uh, active substance use, and they can't do any trauma work until they have some um, detox, excuse me, detox under their belt. Um, they do have um, kind of a hybrid of getting people through. Um, I should note that um, it's important to know that there is no required sobriety time or um, dry time or anything like that before you can start trauma processing or any kind of trauma work. We need people to not be actively using at the time they are doing the, the sessions. Um, we ask them to not be actively using at the time that they're doing homework. Um, but there's nothing that says that, that was more of an old school approach that you have to have six months or a year sober before you can do trauma work. And we know that the current research says that that's not the case at all. Um, so uh, on the PTSD side of the house and the TRC, um, your day is going to be structured with both um, individual case management and groups. And the groups are going to be looking at kind of the whole spectrum. You're going to have groups on affect regulation, uh, groups that have a lot of uh, like that DBT flavor of things. They're going to be um, uh, spirituality groups. There's going to be, um, I, I don't know if they're doing a stair group over there right now. They are doing some of the written exposure therapy. Um, and then in their individual case management, they're going to be doing their trauma work, whether that's EMDR, CPT, or PE. And um, they also have um, kind of going beyond just the psychological, looking at full health or full body. They have nutrition that works with them often. Um, they have rec therapy. So they're getting out and about, um, doing things in the community, practicing, being out at things, especially if they're used to, you know, I'm going to stay home and never be out in crowds. Um, and so really looking at all, kind of that whole spectrum of things. Um, in the past, they've gone to the Phoenix a lot, which is a gym that supports um, sober living. And so that gym has yoga and a lot of different classes and things that um, um, are free. I'm pretty sure it's free um, to be doing that gym. The only requirement is you have to um, have at least, you know, I think probably 20 minutes of sobriety under your belt before you walk in the door. Um, so, um, that that is a good resource as well and um so they're really looking at how do they look at the whole approach so they're probably looking at the family and if any family therapy needs to be involved um, med management making sure everything is leveled out making sure that meds are appropriate for what they're needing um you know people that are used to perhaps sometime in the long term a uh, regimen of meds that wouldn't be conducive to actually feeling emotions and doing trauma processing. So sometimes people get a little um, off kilter because their meds get switched up when they go in, but it's really looking at the long-term approach of how do we do trauma processing and how do we decrease the amount of, um, of medications that a person is on in a way that's And they're open again and they're needing referrals. So please refer folks there. And if people are wanting and ready for trauma work, please refer to us as well in the PCT. Any other questions that y'all may have? If you have questions that come up as you're doing treatment, please don't hesitate to reach out. I am, I am me. Um, I'm gonna throw Dr. Rose in here and just say, you can always, I am her as well, um, or others on our team. Uh, we're more than happy to consult. If you have questions, if somebody needs more of an assessment to have a clear understanding of what would be the most beneficial treatment wise, please let us know. People do not need, there's some um, information that sometimes comes out of the regional office that people have to have um, a PTSD diagnosis in their chart or they have to show assessment or anything like that um, prior to getting service connection. That's not actually the case. Um, so you don't have to refer for anything like that. But if you have questions about who would be a good candidate and why for assessment, 
for treatment, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Well, thanks for coming by, Dr. Kramer. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me speak today, and um, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you.